Hello, uh, I'm Stephen Moore. I'm uh, author of the fantasy novel Grain Law, and I would like to read for you. To get you in the mood, I'd like to begin with the, the blurb that you get on the back of the book, and then I'm going to uh, throw you into the heat of the action um, halfway through the book. I hope you enjoy it. Roderick Wishard is a killer, a liar and a thief. He's the last person the Fae would turn to for help. But they know something he does not. In a world without government or law, where a man's loyalty is to his family and fairy tales are strictly for children, Roderick is not happy to discover that he's carrying fairy blood, especially when he starts to see them wherever he goes. To get his life back, he's going to have to journey further from home than he's ever been before and find out what the Fae could possibly want from him. But that's easier said than done, when the punishment for abandoning your family is death. Chapter 11 Into the Mire I heard again the voices of the old wives calling to me out of my own past. Mind how you go there, child. Keep off the bloody bog moss. It swallows grown men whole. It sucks down full laden fell horses, carts and all. It will leave us no sign to remember you by. Would I have listened? Would I indeed? How do you find the mire? Let me tell you, my friend, in truth, you do not. The mire finds you. My travels took me north and east, but the mire has no constant geography, no certain edge about it. Rather, it comes and it goes. It insinuates itself upon the land. It creeps upon you, lurks patiently in wait. It conceals itself behind an ever-changing mask of pelting rain, of meadow mist, of winter fog or blinding snow. It eats up the very path upon which you tread. It steals upon you and hides the weathered trail. In the darkest night it beckons you in, lures with the light of the jack-o'-lantern. Indeed, this was already a fool's journey, and I, Rogrig, the greater fool, no doubt, for seeking it out. As the fortunes would have it, I did not travel quite alone, although I had to look again to the sky for the first of my companions. Aye, to the birds, to that same crowd of blackbirds, the crows who, it seems, had taken it upon themselves to be my shadow on this foolhardy adventure. They flew so high they appeared to wheel among the clouds pointing the way with the direction of their flight, their vigil keeping my path constant, though it was Dandy's sure footing that held me to the trail. Fair praise where it's due. Without both of my guides I would have quickly been lost. I could neither lead the way through the mire nor follow the shifting signs. My third companion was less expected. It appeared I was being deliberately followed, there was a lone rider at my back, clumsily copying my steps, keeping his distance, yet making no secret of his intentions. When the wind brought his scent to me, I recognised it at once as belonging to Edba the Whittle, Wolfred's son. I told you Wolfred was a shrewd man. Was the youth sent to keep an eye out for me? Was he to be a second right hand? or perhaps his father's spy. Time would tell. I might have called out to the gangly youth, bid him join my party openly. I like the lad well enough, only upon Grainor it is best to leave well alone, to keep to your own business once it is settled upon, he to his and I to mine. There is ever a cunning knife eager to make its mark, an owner looking to his own advantage, and there are just as many mistakes made, 
intentions misconstrued, not worth dying for. Oh, for the freedom of the open fells of the South March, for clear skies and green pastures, how I hated to be closed about with sopping mists and murk. The bogmoss trails, if they were trails at all, were but a trick to the eye. They led nowhere. Each tempting curve of the path, each broken sod, was nothing but a lure and a dead end, or else a dizzying circle, a devil of a dance that left this traveller disorientated, with no sense of here or there. And the trodden path was hardly as broad as a single hoof. Each sure-footed step poor Dandy took was hard found before it was placed. It was a slow and wearisome trial. I should have stayed constantly alert, not given up my guard to a flight of birds. I should have held off my breathy cusses, fought the drowsy man. I should have turned an ear and listened out for the real threat of approaching strangers. That they came upon me at all was a lucky meet. Then again, upon Greenlaw, a man rides his luck when it presents itself. They, a gang of scavenging horse thieves, all the like, and come hot-blooded. I, a seasoned fighting man, but caught and wary and alone. Edbert, by chance or design, was too far distant or unawares to be taken into account. Poor Dandelion broke their path and to their surprise took the full weight of the leading horse almost head on. The iron spike upon her headdress, meant for a unicorn's horn, was driven hard through the animal's neck. It seems it pierced both the horse and the rider equally. Flesh was split apart. Bones broke. Hot blood spurted. As the horse fell, still skewered, we were brought down with it rolled under its thrashing hooves. Instinct alone held me to the saddle. It took Dandy's quick wit and stolid present to save us, as the second and third horses ploughed into the melee. Men cursed, lifted their swords and swung in search of a target. But they were swinging blindly, and at an adversary they were not yet certain of. Is this... Bastard truly a man upon a horse? Aye, aye, or some foul beast, some crude monster. Their reticence, their wary attack, was my good fortune. For it was not the time to stand and make a fight. Dandelion tore herself free of the dying animal. She shied, turned herself about, found her footing, and, with my eager encouragement, bolted, took off at the gallop. Edber was his own man. The circumstance dictates the action. I left him behind to make his own fate, as he left me to make mine. And if I am, among all else, a coward when there is no need of a hero, truly, who is not? If it had been an easier trail and firmer ground, my escape would have been certain. But flight is not a game to play upon the bogmoss. Nor was pursuit for that matter. The remaining riders, perhaps as many as three or four together, judged they had found themselves an easy prey after all, and came after me. More fool them. Their larger, heavier horses were less suited to the uncertain ground even than poor Dandy. The chase was soon done with. I did not have to make a fight of it. The bogmoss caught us all out. It found my pursuers first, and I, soon after, it held us apart. I heard the anguished cries of both the men and, more cruelly, their horses as it took hold of them. They thrashed their limbs about, beating at the sodden earth in a vain hope of gaining a firm purchase and winning their freedom, only hastening their imprisonment. The men's pitiful wails, their horses' desperate whinnies, broke the silence of that failing day, and afterwards, long into the night, coming weaker with every report until almost at the break of dawn, they were finally extinguished. In truth, I fared no better than my enemy, and was as quickly stuck fast. 
One ear, I stayed quite still and calmed poor Dandy's fight with gentle words when instinctively she would have struck out in want of her freedom. My subtle actions greatly slowed our descent into the mire, though I feared there was nothing else to be done. Once the bog moss has you, it will not easily let you go again. It grasps at your feet. It claws at the legs of your fell horse until it finds its hold, and then it binds itself there in a grip that is unrelenting. It envelops, devours, ingests. It holds your still living body in a tomb of stinking mud until the last breath is drawn out. Then, forevermore, it sucks at your slowly decaying corpse until nothing remains, and the captive and the mire are one and the same. So it was, and I would surely have met my own death there without a rescue. I might have expected Edbert to come to me, only it was not him who found me out. In fact, I was so close to an endless sleep I did not see the arms that lifted me from the mire. I only knew their immense strength as they bore my weight and pulled me free, as they led poor Dandy by the rain and guided her to the safety of a sure path. I might have wondered how my rescuer kept their footing, why they did not succumb to the deadly grip of the bog moss. Inside my head I heard their soothing whispers in a shadowed tongue, anxious to calm my fears, if outwardly my ears caught no natural sounds. What I saw, fleetingly, was this, a tall figure, draped in meadow mist. She was dark-skinned, she was lithe, for a moment silhouetted against the coming dawn sky, then suddenly broken apart, a dozen fragments or more, like birds in flight. No, not like, but certainly birds in flight. I'm Stephen Moore, author of the fantasy novel Greenlaw. I hope you enjoyed that. Goodbye.